every house and family is different. And sometimes I am shocked to hear the types of rules that my friends had to follow in their house. Now, I was usually a pretty good rule follower. I never rocked the boat. I never rebelled. But there was one rule that I always hated, nap time. Now, to be clear, from as early as I can remember, my parents never made me take naps. But my grandma did. And I always dreaded it when my grandma came to visit because she seemed convinced that my energetic little body needed to take a two-hour power nap in the middle of the day when I was the most hyper. No matter how hard I tried, I just could not sleep. And I'd just sit there in my room in utter boredom. And this was before I had video games or a cell phone to distract me. And the worst part is that she would come in and check on me while I was sleeping to make sure I was really asleep. And if she found out that I wasn't, she would extend the nap time. So my strategy was foolproof. I would sneak out of my room, I'd play with my toys in the hallway, and as soon as I heard her coming, I'd run back to bed and pretend to be sleeping. And she'd come over to me and check in on me, and I'd be sitting there pretending to sleep, and for some reason, I'd never be able to fool her. She'd come over to me and she'd ask, are you really asleep? And I'd think, okay, this is my moment. You gotta be convincing, put those acting skills to the test. So with my eyes shut, I'd say, yes. And she'd snap at me, you're not really asleep. And then she would extend my nap time. And I remember thinking, how on earth does she know? I was so convincing. Even to this day, it's still a mystery. Uh, Rules and policies are never fun, but usually rules are put in for a good reason, usually to protect you. On the other hand, there are some rules that seem absolutely pointless. I found some of my favorite pointless rules online. And here are just a few that I thought were pretty funny. No crime, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. After 6 p.m., go for it. Or how about this one? No alcohol, no profanity, no smoking, no nudity, no penguins. I feel like there's a story here. Okay, last one. Please don't. Just don't. A lot of people would claim that Christianity is just a bunch of pointless rules. That over the centuries, we've just created a religious system of do's and don'ts, and that Jesus didn't actually endorse any of this. But is that true? We're in a series called The Counterfeit Jesus. And just like there are counterfeit bills or counterfeit watches, there are counterfeit Jesuses. On the surface, they look like the real thing, but when you really get down to it, they're nothing more than a cheap replica. And we've talked so far about the everyman Jesus, the Jesus that wasn't really God, just a great moral teacher, an example for us. We've also talked about the anti-evangelism Jesus, the Jesus that says all religions are basically the same, all roads lead to heaven, If you've missed those weeks, go back and watch them on our website. They're well worth it. But today we're talking about the anti-religious Jesus. This is the rebel Jesus, the rule breaker Jesus. He's the guy who breaks the Sabbath. He calls out the religious elite and certainly wouldn't endorse any of this organized religion stuff. And so today we're going to put the anti-religious Jesus under the microscope and see if it lines up with the real Jesus that we know through the Bible. And in doing so, we're going to discover more about the real Jesus. So let's get started. If you're taking notes, write this down. The anti-religious Jesus was against organized corporate religion. This is the Jesus who always pushed against the rules. He called out people for being sticklers to the law. He emphasized love above anything else. And if this Jesus saw the church today, he'd be disgusted. Hundreds of people gathered together, reading the word together, worshiping together, giving of their finances He would say, no, 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 this is all wrong. You don't need a pastor to preach the word to you. You just need your personal relationship with God. I'll give you an example. Uh, One of the laws of Jesus' day was to observe the Sabbath. This is a law that God instituted for the nation of Israel all the way back in Moses' day. Six days of the week you work, and on the Sabbath you rest. No work was to be done on the Sabbath. And if you look at the life of Jesus, you will see the religious leaders always calling him out for working on the Sabbath. I'll give you an example. It says, on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman came there who was crippled by a spear for 18 years. She was bent over and she could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on one of those days, but not on the Sabbath. And the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? 
Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Look, here's a perfect example. Jesus cares more about love than these pithy little rules. Jesus willingly broke the Sabbath, a law, because love was more important. For Jesus, rules and religions didn't matter. What matters is love. In fact, this happens so many times in the Gospels that it's not surprising that people think Jesus is against organized religion. And listen, if you adhere to the anti-religious Jesus, then this applies to you as well. Don't worry about what the Bible says about sexual immorality or drunkenness or being generous or being part of a church community. Religion is all about rituals and ceremonies, but that stuff just gets in the way. And church is just really one big ritual. What really matters is that you have a personal relationship with Jesus. All these extra things just get in the way. But that's not it. If you're taking notes, the anti-religious Jesus was also against religious people. If you look throughout the Gospels, Jesus has lots of loving words for the sinners. When he interacts with the tax collectors or the prostitutes, he accepts them and he loves them. But when you see him interacting with religious people, he's got nothing good to say. There's a famous passage in the Bible where Jesus pronounces seven woes or seven issues that he has with the Pharisees, the religious leaders. I'll read one of them to you. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to be people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Those are some pretty harsh words. I mean, clearly religion means nothing and love is everything. Jesus never pulls a tax collector aside and, and lists all the problems that he has with them. He loves them, but he despises the religious. See, this is the portrait of the anti-religious Jesus. And maybe this Jesus sounds great to you. Maybe you look at that and you're thinking, man, I could get behind that Jesus, down with organized religion. Just give me my relationship with Jesus and I'll be set. The problem is, this isn't the real Jesus. When we look at the real Jesus, we start to see a pretty different picture. As your outline says, the real Jesus participated in the religious practice of his day. At this time in Israel's history, all religious practice revolved around the temple sacrificial system and the law of Moses. And Jesus participated in all of that. Jesus went to the temple often. Jesus participated in the synagogues and he taught scripture there. Jesus believed that the Old Testament was God's word. And Jesus even endorsed the practice of giving money to the temple. All of that is what we would call organized religion. So, so then why did Jesus break rules regarding the Sabbath? Clearly he had no respect for the law of Moses, right? Actually, Jesus never broke the law. In fact, he never preached against the law at all. Jesus didn't break the law. He broke what scholars call fence laws. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're taking notes, write this down. A fence law was a made-up law to help you not break the real law. If you look in the Old Testament, there were 613 commands within the law. These were laws that the Israelites actually had to follow, and Jesus didn't go against any of these. Jesus actually fulfilled the law. Religious leaders like the Pharisees, they placed a huge emphasis on following the law. They followed it to a T, and they were so concerned with breaking the law that they created fence laws. For example, let's say that the real law was don't touch the clock, okay? The Pharisees would see that law and they would build a fence around the clock so that you couldn't even get close to touching the clock. So the real law is don't touch the clock, but the fence law would be don't even enter the room where the clock is because if you never enter the room, then you never get tempted to touch the clock. It even got to the point where they would limit the amount of steps a person could take on the Sabbath so that they wouldn't accidentally cross into what would be considered work. The Sabbath was no longer about resting and being filled by God's presence. It became a legalistic checklist. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and you have taken hold of human traditions. They actually elevated these fence laws to the same importance as the real laws, sometimes even greater importance. And I think it's important to ask ourselves, what even is the purpose of the law? 
Why did God even give the Israelites the law? Well, the law was all about dealing with sin. Sin separates us from God. God is holy and perfect and we are sinful and broken. And the law was given as the guidelines of a covenant relationship between Israel and God. See, God's presence would come and dwell with his people and he would protect them and he would guide them. And God also instituted the sacrificial system in the temple, which people could come and offer up a sacrifice and the Israelite would deserve the punishment for their sin, but the sacrifice would receive the punishment instead. It would be a substitute. So the law was to show people their sin and how to deal with their sin. This is how they could be in relationship with God. It wasn't actually intended to be something that they could actually follow perfectly because if they could, then they wouldn't need God in the first place. Paul touches on this when he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So the law reveals sin. It shows us that we're sinful and we're broken. It shows us our need for God. To explain this, I'm going to use some random stuff that I found around the church. Okay, so imagine that this little plant is sin. Sin is the problem. Now imagine the clock is God. Sin is the problem. The clock is God. And this little Donkey Kong is the law. Okay, so the law is the method by which our sin can be dealt with. Our sin is the problem. The law helps us get to God. Okay, the problem is that over many centuries, for many people, God was completely removed from the picture altogether and the law became the goal. I just need to be a good person. I just need to follow the laws and if I do, then I'll be justified. The law became God and God was actually removed from the picture altogether. And for Jesus, his goal was not to abolish the law and say that they were wrong for following the law, but to remind them what the purpose of the law really was and it was to get to God. Also, Jesus was not against religious people. As your outline says, the real Jesus was against hypocrisy and self-righteousness. See, Jesus wasn't upset with the Pharisees because they practiced their religion. He was upset with them because they only cared about appearances and they looked down on others who weren't as good as them. It says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. See, they would see people who were more sinful as them as dirty. They wouldn't even want to associate with them. They thought that if they did, that they would get defiled. And so when Jesus would spend time with these people, they would say things like, well, if Jesus is such a great teacher, then why does he associate himself with sinners? They thought that they didn't need God because they followed the law so well. And Jesus's goal was to show just how sinful they really were. The Pharisees, they would look at laws like don't murder and don't commit adultery and they'd say, check, I haven't done that today. I'm a good person. But I I mean, it's pretty easy not to go around murdering people. Jesus showed them, actually, if you have hate in your heart against somebody, if you look at somebody lustfully, you're still breaking these laws. Holiness doesn't flow from the outside. It comes from the inside. And so outwardly, they look like they were doing everything right. But it was a checklist. And it was a means of puffing themselves up to make them look better. This is what Jesus was against. Jesus is against the kind of religion that's all about ego or all about how you look, all about appearances. God's not against religion. In fact, God set up the religious expressions that Jesus practiced in his day. Jesus imparted the first disciples to be an organized group of Christ followers who would go out and share the gospel and bring more people into their organized group. He commanded them to do religious things like baptize people and to partake in communion together. These are things you can't do without other followers of Jesus. You can't baptize yourself. Communion is designed to be taken together. As your outline says, Jesus was never against organized religion, but he was always against corrupt religion. See, Jesus wasn't against the temple, He was against the corrupt practices taking place in the temple that were taking advantage of people. Jesus wasn't against the Pharisees practicing their religion. He was against them lording their religion over others. And Jesus wasn't against the law. He was against the idolization of the law. 
See, the religion of Jesus' day was to bring people into the presence of God, but many people had skewed it. And instead of inviting people into the presence of God, they became gatekeepers of the presence of God. So much so that the people who needed God the most could never experience him because they couldn't live up to the expectations that were placed on them. This is the type of religion that Jesus taught against. And all of this got me thinking, if, if Jesus is against corrupted religion, then what would he think about us today? If Jesus walked the earth right now, what types of things would he call out? Now, it doesn't take long to realize that the church throughout history has fallen into corruption. In fact, it doesn't even take long to find churches today that fall into corruption. So how do we as Christ followers avoid falling into corrupted religion? Well, I think we can learn a lot from how Jesus confronted this type of corruption in his day. Number one, I think Jesus would confront misguided priorities. We know this because Jesus confronted this very thing amongst the Jewish leaders of his day. The law was meant to guide people towards God, but many people made the law their God. They placed a greater emphasis on human traditions than the actual law that God had given them. So the minute that we start coming to church for a show, rather than the presence of God, we can know that we have misguided priorities. The minute that we start reading our Bible just to check it off the list and say we're good Christians, we can know that we have misguided priorities. The minute that we start praying for our will to be done rather than God's will to be done, we can know that we have misguided priorities. The minute that we start valuing our attendance at church rather than our involvement and service in the church, we can know that we have misguided priorities. And the minute that we start making our communities an exclusive social club rather than an inviting, welcoming environment, we can know that we have misguided priorities. These are the types of pitfalls that many Christ followers fall into. It's the same types of pitfalls that the Pharisees fell into. Do you have misguided priorities? Having right priorities means caring more about what matters to Jesus and less about what doesn't. Secondly, I think that Jesus would confront hypocrisy and self-righteousness. The Pharisees cared more about their image than anything. They looked great on the outside, but on the inside, they were far from God. Sometimes, even in the church, we can forget that we're all broken people who struggle with sin all the time. Church isn't about showing off or looking down on those who struggle. If we can't be real and authentic, and all we care about is impressing people with how holy we are, then we are falling into the same pitfalls that the Pharisees fell into. Jesus once told a parable about this. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector here. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. As a church, we ought to have the same type of attitude that the tax collector had, an attitude of humility that recognizes our sinfulness and our need for God. Is that an attitude that you have today? Or do you get puffed up with pride when you see someone worse than you? Lastly, I think that Jesus would confront exclusivity. Some people might uh, accuse the church of being an exclusive club that you can only be part of if you believe in Jesus. And I think that shows that maybe we haven't done a great job of showing just how inclusive God's love really is. I mean, think about it. No matter your background, no matter your socioeconomic status, your race, your gender, no matter your sin, your struggles, your past, each of us is loved by God. Each of us is worthy of experiencing a relationship with God. Is that the message that people see and hear when they come to Broadway? I hope so. Because it's so easy to gatekeep church. Nope, sorry, if you don't look like me or talk like me or behave like me, then you can't be part of us. Jesus demonstrated this when he would spend time with both the Pharisees and the tax collectors, the Jewish leaders and the Gentile nobodies, the devoted followers and the promiscuous prostitutes. Do people feel welcome here or do we give them sideways glances? Are we making it as easy as possible for people to experience the presence of God? Because if we're gatekeeping God, 
then we're once again falling into the same pitfalls as the Pharisees. Maybe you've decided to write off religion altogether because you've had some bad expressions of it. Maybe you've been part of a church that's hurt you. Or maybe you've watched a, a church leader who's in a position of authority living hypocritically. Maybe you're horrified as you see what some organized religions have done throughout history. I totally, totally understand your frustration, your confusion, maybe even your anger. But I also promise you that there are communities out there that practice religion the way God intended. Using churches and groups of followers and organized religion is actually the way that Jesus intended that we follow him because we can do more together than on our own. Listen to what true religion can do. This is from the earliest days of the church. It says that they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want to challenge you to pursue this. This is what God desires. We could put on a big show for the world to see, but it would ring hollow and you would see right through it. But when we come authentically to God and allow him to use us, it's amazing the types of things he can do. Let's pray. As we close, I wanna lead you in a short prayer if you've never made a decision before to follow Jesus. If you wanna make that decision today, repeat these words after me. Say, God, I've messed up, I've sinned, I've turned my own way, and have done my own thing. I don't deserve your love. I can never earn your love. But today I choose to accept this gift of forgiveness that you offer me. I choose to turn away from my sin. I choose to follow you. I know I won't be perfect, but I know that I'm a child of God. Thank you for new life. Today I give you mine. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, my best advice for you is to text the number on the screen and a pastor will get back to you with your next steps in your faith journey. Thanks so much for joining us today. Have a great week.